week's story by Addie is about a recovery, her recovery from end stage of renal disease to kidney transplant. And we're here with Addie today. I just want to go over a little bit about Addie and we'll go ahead and turn the table over to her. Addie was born January 5th, 1974 in Columbus, Ohio. She has one older sister and two older brothers. Her mother was poor and uneducated and found herself at an early age, um, at 23, with four kids and with no support system. When Addie was five years old, her mom killed her boyfriend uh, because he was abusive. So with that, she was convicted of involuntary manslaughter, which resulted four of these kids to go into the foster homes. On the upside, Addie was able to find a loving home with parents that were able to put her into good schooling and higher education. So uh, with the love of support of the foster family, she was able to graduate number nine in her high school class and attended the Ohio State uh, University on a full scholarship. She went to attend also Howard University of Law and graduated with honors in 1999. Following the law school, she worked for Maryland Legal Aid System as a staff attorney, then supervising attorney for 13 years. Her husband, Tim, and her celebrate their 13 year anniversary this year. We say happy anniversary from all of us to Addie and Tim. And she's here today to go over her journey, her story and sharing that with us. I'm delighted to have her. Thank you, Addie, for being here with us on Stories by You. Thank you, Pranas, for giving me the opportunity. I'm very happy to be here to share my story. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about the diagnosis and how did you learn to to know uh, what you were going through? So my diagnosis came in 2006. Well, actually it started in 2006 when I was pregnant with my daughter, Jasmine, who's now 14. Um, the pregnancy was exceptionally difficult. I was sick for most of the time that I was pregnant. And even um, after I delivered, I continued to have um, fevers and medical issues. Mm -hmm. Um, during the pregnancy, I had started developing um, what my doctor thought was pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, it continued to get worse towards the end of the pregnancy, so ended up having to have my labor-induced, but unfortunately, the high blood pressure did not resolve with the pregnancy. So um, after several months of waiting to see if it would resolve on its own, I was sent back to my primary doctor who did some blood work and noticed some um, numbers that she was just very uncomfortable with. And so she referred me to a nephrologist. Um, by this time, it was about 2008. Um, Jasmine was um, probably around one year old. And after the nephrologist did a, a several rounds of tests and ordered an ultrasound of my abdomen, um, he learned that I have a condition called polycystic kidney disease which is basically a genetic condition that causes uh, the growth of benign cysts in the kidneys. And over time, those cysts become bigger and take up all of the healthy kidney, uh, kidney tissue. And so because of that replacement of healthy tissue, the kidneys just stop functioning. Um, so at that point, I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease and um, my kidneys were only functioning at about 20% at that point. So that's when I learned that my kidneys were basically on their way out. Wow. So uh, with that, how did this diagnosis affect your day-to-day -day life? Well, you know, initially I didn't really feel much effect of it. And I think that's why I was able to go through a period of denial. Mm -hmm. um, one of the really insidious things about kidney disease is that there really aren't a lot of uh, symptoms until your function is so low that you start to become really sick. So I was diagnosed in 2008. I continued working, life pretty much went on as usual. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, they're wrong. They're going to, I'm going to go in there one day for blood work and they're going to tell me, oh, we made a mistake. This is, your kidneys are fine. 
But every time I went in, I was going about every six months just so they could do blood work. My kidney function continued to decrease. And by 2012, uh, my kidney function had decreased to about 15%. I had at that point started really experiencing um, symptoms. I was severely anemic, which really leads to uh, chronic fatigue. So I had no energy. I was really having trouble functioning at work. I think the worst symptom for me was a loss of mental acuity um, because as an attorney, being able to communicate effectively and look at a novel legal issue and be able to figure it out and think on my feet, I, I kind of lost all of that ability really, really quickly when my symptoms started to get worse. So um, at that point in 2012, I had no choice but to um, start kidney dialysis because I had been on the transplant list since 2008. They had not found the donor for me yet. So um, that, you know, dialysis was, for me, it was an everyday process because I opted to do dialysis at home. So every day when I got home from work, I had to hook up to this machine, um, do my treatment overnight so that I could continue, you know, living and functioning. And that what did have a significant impact on my life because if I wanted to travel, I had to make arrangements to schedule, uh, you know, to carry material, you know, supplies with me so that I could do my treatment when I was traveling. Um, nighttime activities had to be limited because I needed to be at home by a certain time so that I could do a complete treatment overnight. Um, it really, it impacted pretty much every aspect of my life because everything that I wanted to do, it had to fit around my dialysis schedule. So the career was definitely impacted by this, as you just mentioned, because there's just so many, so many factors, your job mm -hmm. had to, you had to be in a good state um, mentally and physically to uh, do your job. So with, so since you touched on the career as well, can you tell us a little bit more about what life was after the, um, the pregnancy? Um, well, you mentioned pregnancy and pregnancy is a part of the story, but let me, let me back up just a second. Um, so I was able to continue working initially after I was um, diagnosed mm -hmm. because I was doing my treatments at home. Um, it was difficult, as I said, because I was doing dialysis every day. And even though dialysis replaces some of what you get from healthy kidney function, yeah. it, it, it's, it's nowhere close to what someone with healthy functioning kidneys has. So I still dealt with a lot of fatigue and um, you know, just trying to balance having two small children and a, a very demanding um, career at a, a large public interest law firm. But I was, I, was, I was managing it, I was making it work until 2013. Um, as you mentioned, I got pregnant with Christopher. And that just added a, a whole other layer of difficulty to the situation because um, as you know, your kidneys are what keeps your body clean. And so when you get pregnant, your kidneys are not only supporting you, but supporting your unborn baby. So I was trying to use dialysis to support myself and my baby's development. And my, my health physically um, started to decline. Um, my doctors were very concerned about my um, well-being as well as that of the baby. And both my nephrologist as well as my high-risk pre pregnancy uh, specialist recommended that I consider uh, terminating the pregnancy. Um, Tim and I just couldn't imagine doing that. We both had prayed um, to have a son. And when we found out that I was having a boy, the idea of um, not going forward with the pregnancy, just um, it just didn't sit right in, in my spirit, to be perfectly honest. So we, we understood the risks, but we decided to go forward um, with the pregnancy. And it was, it was extremely difficult. Um, usually by the time I got home from work in the evening, I was, I was exhausted. Um, I had to do increased dialysis treatments to accommodate my, myself and the baby. And um, essentially, because I could tell that my health was starting to decline, and then on top of that, I was going to be having the responsibility of caring for a newborn, mm -hmm. um, Tim and I just decided that after I had the baby, I would not be returning to my job at Legal Aid. So that was a very difficult decision for me because um, as you mentioned, my mother came from a very um, impoverished background. 
growing up in foster care, a lot of people always felt that my siblings and I were never going to amount to much. And so my career as an attorney and the things that I have been able to accomplish was something that I felt it really defined me. And so making the decision to give up my career, it, it, was, it was extremely difficult for me, but I realized that um, for my health and in order for me to be able to care for my son, it was the right decision. So um, in October, two, 2013, uh, shortly before Christopher was born, I left my position at Legal Aid. Wow. So um, how are things with after the, um, the birth of the child? Like, how's Christopher doing? Christopher is wonderful. He's an amazing, um, precocious little eight-year-old. And I say eight-year-old with, with such joy, knowing that there were so many people who were concerned about whether he would actually make it here. Um, but because the pregnancy was so... Um, challenging for me physically, um, my health really declined during the pregnancy. And um, I would say that my entire 12 year journey of dealing with um, kidney disease and dialysis, I think the worst um, period was between 2014 and 2018, because during that time um, I was in and out of the hospital. I had um, I believe five different surgical procedures to manage different issues. I had to have my parathyroid gland removed because my body was no longer able to properly process um, calcium. So that landed me in the uh, in the, the uh, ICU for about a week. Um, I had other just structural problems. I developed a, a hernia during the, the pregnancy that required surgery. Um, so my body was was just physically weak. And I think because I've always had such a, a, an active life, mm -hmm. the decline in my health, it, it affected my mental health. It affected me spiritually um, because it was hard for me to, to, I guess, get my mind around the fact that physically I just wasn't able to do the things that I felt I should be able to do. Um, in 2017, things got pretty bad. I developed a um, very serious infection called peritonitis that landed me in the hospital for about two weeks. Um, it took them about a week to figure out what the infection was and why I was so sick. And because during that time I was in so much physical pain that I, I literally was doubled over. I was existing on morphine while I was in the hospital. And I distinctly remember a day where I was just feeling so low and I was sitting in my hospital room by myself in the bathroom with, you know, tears just streaming down my face and just praying. And because of the pain that I was in and how mentally and physically exhausted I was, I just, you know, prayed and asked God, if this, if this is it, if this is my life, you know, I'm ready to go. I, I was just asking God to just take my life because I was just so tired of what I was dealing with. And in that moment, I remember praying and asking God, you know, do you hear me? Do you see what I'm going through? Can you just send someone to be here with me so that I know that you are listening? And I went and got back in my hospital bed. And I kid you not, within probably 10 minutes, a really good friend of mine came into the room. She, I didn't know she was coming, hadn't talked to her in quite a while. And she came and sat next to my hospital bed and just held my hand and prayed with me. And in that moment, I knew that it was only because of, of that cry, that cry, outcry to God and him saying to me, sending her to say, I, I hear you. I see what you're going through. And I've already worked out the future. And, you know, just the act of her being there, it really helped me get through that very rough um, patch that I was in. I know, I believe in my heart, no one will ever be able to tell me differently that it was, it was only God that sent her there to be with me. Um, so following that, I got, after I got out of the hospital, I had to stop doing my treatments at home because of the infection. So then I was going to uh, do my treatments in center for three days a week. Um, I did that for about a year or so. And um, after my health had recovered and I, I felt like I was able to manage it, I then went back to doing treatments at home. And that allowed me to 
recover some of my health, recover some of my activities. And I even started working as a patient advocate, talking to other patients about the benefits of doing treatments at home. So Love. that's, <laughs> yeah. You used um, the experiences of what happened to you to help others to serve. Um, and with, with God, everything is possible. And definitely that was a guardian angel that was sent to you from God. So um, there, is, there is a lot here that we're covering in such a short period of time. So Addy, let me ask if there's anyone out there and they find your story encouraging, they want to know more about it, uh, but they're discouraged because they're dealing with something. There's some something that they need to get done, whether it's kidney transplant or, um, you know, something that they're waiting for God to, to tell them. Is there any word of encouragement, anything that you can tell those people watching you right now? I would simply tell them to do as the Bible says and pray without ceasing to take your petitions to God and do it with gratitude and just acknowledge him and remember that he's not going to always answer our prayers the way we think that he should or in the timing that we wish he would but his timing is always perfect. And I can, I can say that with all sincerity because after 12 years of being on the transplant list, last year during the pandemic with everything horrible that was happening in 2020 or 2020 and 2021, I received a kidney transplant after 12 years on the transplant list. So God answered my prayer in his time and I am using this opportunity to, um, go to him and find out what what my next steps are in line with his plan so stay encouraged um and don't don't be afraid to question him and ask him because he's big enough to ha and to handle all of our concerns and and all of our doubts yes he does listen and amen to that thank you so much and if there's anyone that want to get in contact with you Addy, what's the best form um email is always great my email address is Addie Momeyer, A-D-D-I-E-M-O-M-Y-E-R at gmail.com. Thank you, Addie. Once again, I want to thank all of your, our audience for watching. I want to thank you, Addie, for sharing your story and being here, being courageous enough to share a story like this. Um, you've been through a lot, you and your family. So um, I'm honored to have you and um, thank you again. Thank you for having me, Farnas. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much for all of the subscribers and your support and love. Uh, until next week, uh, if you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, and share this video. Have a good week. Mm -hmm.